Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, here we go. One more program, and then we've got these four finished once again. And uh, again, we like to always welcome our television audience. In case we have a new listener, we're just a simple Bible study. We uh, try not to attack anyone, and uh, that's not my purpose. All we want people to do is see what the book says, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, that you'll not just blind yourselves to one denomination. If they're on track, fine, but a lot of them aren't. So you have to determine that by searching the scriptures. And uh, now our last several programs, we've been dealing with the day of the Lord, those final seven years, and they can scoff at it all they want. But uh, the book says it's going to happen. If the book says it, it's going to happen. I just have to keep repeating that. And uh, a lot of them now are starting to scorn this, even theologians, that all this is long in the past. It's all been fulfilled. And I have to say, when? When? And none of this has ever happened before. If it hadn't happened before, it's still out in the future. And I one, read one article again the other night that since Jesus came back there in 70 AD, and then blah, 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 blah. What? Jesus returned in 70 AD? Yeah, that's what's out there. So I have to just encourage you, stop and think. Did anything happen historically that all of this is referring to? No. So it's still out in front of us. Okay, so we're going to finish up this four programs in book 71. My little wife wants me to have you aware of that. Book 71. And the uh, first four, no, last four, right? Last four. I can't keep track of them all. <laughs> anyway, now we're going to do something a little different. We've been looking at these seven years, not in depth, but just enough to whet your appetite. On this half hour, we're going to look how it's all going to end. It's only going to go seven years. And what happens at the end of the seven years? All right. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. This is the second coming of Christ. All right. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness, not with all the satanic wickedness of the Antichrist, but this Christ will come in righteousness, and he doth judge and make war for the purpose of defeating the wicked God opposing Antichrist in his world. All right? Verse 12. His eyes, the Messiah, the Christ, his eyes were as. Now, it doesn't say they were, but they were like burning flames of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now here it comes, verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now put verse 13 in your computer for just a few seconds, and we're going to come back to it. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. Now wait a minute. Don't picture him with a Roman sword or a dagger in his teeth. But again, compare Scripture with Scripture. What is the sword of the Lord? The Word of God. So he speaks and things happen. See? All right. And so out of his mouth, verse 15, goeth a sharp sword, that with it the spoken word, now remember, he will smite the nations, plural, he shall rule them with a rod of iron when he sets up his kingdom following all this. And he, now we come back into the seven years again, he treadeth 
the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, if you've got a translation that capitalizes all that, every time I see this, I have to think of the other time when Rome put a caption above him, and what was theirs? This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But this is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he's going to rule and reign this planet like it's never been ruled before. But before he sets up his kingdom and before he establishes his rule, he's going to finish the punishment of wicked mankind. Now, remember when we started this several programs back, we used the analogy of a mortgage. Satan has got the planet mortgaged ever since Adam dropped the ball. And how is God going to pay off the mortgage? With the horrors of these last seven years. Judgment, chastisement, vengeance, and wrath. All right, it's going to be depicted now then in several areas of Scripture like grapes in a wine vat. Now, we've been over in Jerusalem, and it was interesting, and I guess things like that sit in my mind, where they had an ancient wine vat which had been carved out of stone, and then they gave a demonstration of how they would put their teenage kids in that wine vat, and they would just stomp the grapes, and the juice ran out the bottom. Well, all right, that's the same analogy of Scripture so far as God's final judgment on this planet is concerned. All right, now we're going to jump back from Revelation. I'm going to take you all the way back to Isaiah, chapter 63. And this is the beauty of Scripture. And then they have the wherewithal to ridicule this and say it's just a bunch of myths and legends when it's written hundreds, if not thousands of years apart, and it all fits, how can they? That's what makes this book what it is. Isaiah 63, now written 700 years before Christ. Isaiah 63, and we're going to start at verse 1. And just let the Scripture speak to you. All got it? Verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Now, you've got to know your Middle East geography a little bit. Edom was down there south of the Dead Sea, southwest of Israel. Not all that far, maybe 100 miles. But here is where evidently his second coming is going to begin. He's going to start down there to the southwest, and he's just going to be moving up towards the nation of Israel. All right, and he comes with dyed garments from Bozrah, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And so the prophet asks, Wherefore are you red in your apparel, and your garments like him that, what? Treadeth in the wine vat. So what's the color of his outer clothing? Grape juice, like he's been treading in the wine vat. But there's another commodity that has the same color, and what is it? Blood. And so here we have the analogy then that his garments are literally stained with blood like the treader of grapes in the wine vat is stained with grape juice. There's the comparison. All right, now let's read on. Verse 3. The coming Christ answers, I have trodden the winepress alone. He hasn't had others to help him. And of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them. I'll keep the analogy of the wine vat. Don't lose that. I will tread them, that is, humanity, in my anger. Now here again, let me compare Scripture with Scripture. Keep your hand in Revelation, Isaiah, 
Now come all the way back to Psalms chapter 2, which we use over and over and over. I used it at the beginning of this series. And I want you to see how language fits all the way through. Psalms chapter 2. Jumping in at verse 4. The human race, Jew and Gentile together have rejected the Messiah. And then verse 4 of Psalms 2, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them, that is, humanity, in derision. And then, the day is coming. That's a time word. Then he shall speak unto them in his, what? Wrath. Not love. Not grace. Wrath. What's the other word for wrath? Anger. Like you just saw in Isaiah. I will speak to them in his wrath and he will vex them. What does that mean? He's just utterly going to crush them. See? Okay, come back to Isaiah. He will utterly vex them in his sore displeasure. I will tread them, going back into verse 3 again. I will tread them in my anger. I will trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. That's why they were stained. And I will stain all my raiment from his exercising the wrath and vexation of God on Christ rejecting Humanity. Now I better stop a minute. Are people going to be prone to say that God is unfair? Yeah, they will. They'll say, well, this is supposed to be a God of love, a God of mercy. doesn't sound like it to me. No, his mercy has ended. He has now given mankind 6,000 years of his grace. And they walk it underfoot. And the further we go, the more they hate him, the more they detest him. And even our beloved nation, what we th always thought was Christian, is getting further and further from it every day. And do you think God is going to let us get away with it? No way. No way. In fact, uh, I had a call yesterday. What was the meaning of the parable of the pounds? Well, it's real simple. We call it, to whom much is given, much is what? required. And that was the parable. To whom he gave 10 pounds, he required something that was comparable to it in return. To whom he gave five, he expected something less. Well, all right, the same way in nations. America has been so blessed. We have had such a spiritual background in our nation. And what are we doing with it? Walking it underfoot. We're despising it. And so I've said it for 30 years. When judgment comes, America is going to suffer the worst of all because we have been the most blessed. We're the most privileged. We've been given the most pounds, according to the parable. And so it behooves us to be aware of that. All right, back to Isaiah 63. <clears throat> Verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. Now that brings up another thought. When some of the religions of the world hate Christians and they persecute them and put them to death, do we as a Christian people respond in kind? No. That's why it's so difficult. They can come and kill Christians and we can't load up our 30 aught sixes and shoot them in the back as they leave. That's totally contrary to our concept of godliness. The whole difference between Christianity and the other religions of the world is our whole foundation of everything is love, not hate, not vengeance. The other religions can say, if they oppose you, kill them. And we can't do that. That's why we have to fight with our hands tied behind their back. We can't respond in kind. In fact, a verse in Romans comes to mind. Keep your hand in Isaiah, keep your hand in Revelation, and let's just look at Romans a minute to, to get an idea that, yes, 
the day is coming when God is going to speak in vengeance like the world has never seen. But that's not the way Christianity operates today. Romans chapter 12. And always remember this. We can't respond in kind. We can't respond by just killing our enemies. We're to love them. But yes, that's working with your hands tied behind your back. But we know that God is in control. All right, you got Romans chapter 12, verse 17. This is our modus operandi. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And now verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. See, we don't take vengeance on our enemies, but rather give place unto wrath, that is, of the enemy. For it is written, here it comes now, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals. All right, so when the Lord finally pours out wrath and vexation and judgment, it's only because they have rejected him for 6,000 years and his patience has finally run out. And it will be a judgment that is just and fair and he will not have abrogated the whole idea of love one iota. All right, back to Isaiah 63. This is the end of the day of the Lord. This is the second coming, but it's going to be preceded with wrath and vexation on the human race. Verse 4 again. For the day of vengeance is in my heart. The year of my redeemed is come. And I looked. And there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And now verse 6. I will tread down the people in my anger and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. All right, now in that same light, let's just look at Jeremiah, since we're back in the Old Testament anyway. Verse 30. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. A totally different prophet, writing a hundred years later. And he doesn't write because of what he read in Isaiah. He writes by the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the others write. And he makes the same analogy. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. <clears throat> Jeremiah 25, verse 30. Therefore, prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord. Now that's God the Son. That's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament language. The Lord shall roar from on high. See, this is his second coming now. And he will utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. Here comes. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. All right, now then let's go all the way back, if you will, again to Revelation. Chapter 14, and now we can drop in at verse 14. And remember, this is all at the end of the day of the Lord, although we can call the, the kingdom thousand years as part of it. But this is the end of the vengeance and the wrath, the seven years of tribulation. 
All right, verse 14 of Revelation 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Now remember, that's a reference to Christ in his earthly ministry for sure. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, which speaks of harvest, doesn't it? All right, thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, if you look in the Greek, it is almost overripe. It's beyond the normal. All right, verse 16. He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. It was harvested. Now, of course, we're going to be looking at the grapevine and, and literally taking off the lumps of grape and throwing them into the wine vat. All right, verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. Yet another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. Now, what does the vine always speak of? Grapes in Scripture. But the grapes in this instance are what? Humanity. That's the analogy. Thrust in your sickle and gather the humanity that is ready for judgment. And the book of Revelation has told us earlier that the worse the things got, the more they blasphemed. They don't repent. They don't turn and say, God, what would you have me to do? They blaspheme all the more. All right, so God just continues now to bring in his wrath and vexation and so he gathers humanity just like the husbandman would gather the grapes and cast them into the wine vat. Now verse 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now, this isn't grace, this isn't mercy, this isn't love, this is judgment. And it's coming. The world is getting more prepared for it every day. All right, so he brings it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now, verse 20, we get a picture of where is this symbolic wine vat. Verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Well, what city is Scripture always focused on? Jerusalem. So now we're talking about the homeland of Israel. Now here I'm going to put in my own projection. And I'm thinking that the winepress of humanity will be the valleys of Israel. Now, there are three or four great valleys in the little land of Israel. You've got the Hula Valley up north of Galilee. You've got the Valley of Sharon around the west, uh, eastern end of the Mediterranean. You've got the Valley of Megiddo that runs from uh, Mount Carmel toward Galilee. And then you have the Jordan Valley that runs all the way down to the Dead Sea. All right, now the way I look at this is that the generals of the Antichrist armies will bring in their millions and they will pack them in to these valleys of Israel. Now again, I could say this is my own projection, but I think I'm, I'm as close as you can get. Remember, we're in a period of time when God is now in control of everything. The Antichrist is now under his judgment and all his armies. And I think God is going to cause the generals of these armies to put their armies into these valleys of Israel contrary to any ounce of common sense. They're going to just pack them in like sardines. Now picture them, the Hula Valley to the north, 
the valley of Sharon along the Mediterranean Sea coast, the valley of Megiddo in the middle, the Jordan Valley down here, and they all more or less geographically interconnect. Pack them with millions of troops of the world's armies. This is Armageddon. And God is going to crush them like grapes in a wine vat. Now finish the verse. And the wine press was trodden without or outside the city of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem sits on hills, you know. But blood comes out of the wine press. Picture my valleys. Blood comes out of the wine press, even to the horse's bridles. Three feet, four feet deep. And that is going to cause a river of blood that will go for 1,600 furlongs, or about 180 miles, a river of blood. All right, you say, how in the world can it happen? Well, skip across to chapter 16, and this is how I think. I can't prove this from Scripture, but I think I'm showing the connection that the final judgment that is going to fall on the planet Earth is now described here in, uh, I think i got time to go all the way up to verse 19 of chapter 60. And we're bringing it down to the final hours of this seven years and the second coming of Christ. Verse 19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. New York, London, San Francisco, Chicago, they're all going to fall. All right, all the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon. And that's, again, a reason I think that perhaps Iraq may come down and yet blossom out of the desert and be a great financial center for all this. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine, there's your grapes again, of the fierceness of his wrath, and here comes what I call the crushing element of the grapevine, these valleys full of men. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every hailstone the weight of a talent or a hundred pounds, and men blasphemed God because of the hail, for it was exceeding great. What have you got? The crushing element of these valleys full of men and mixed with water and blood. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.